lovely people. Um, let's get started. So those of you who might have missed my talk uh, last week, I am Tasha, uh, but everyone calls me Tasha. And um, I live in Abingdon, which is right next to Oxford in England. And um, I live with my fiance um, and my two cats. Now, for those of you who are just joining, just want to show you, I mean, what a great way to start the day is I've got, I got a big delivery the other day and I've got my cat Wesley literally in the box there. Why do cats love boxes so much? What is that? What? Why do they love a box? And hello, hello, thank you for joining. Um, as always, if you have any questions at any point, hello. Um, any questions, please just let me know and ask away. It doesn't have to be on topic. It can be something that's been bugging you, something that you're curious about. And yeah, it'll be really nice talking again. Today, I'm going to do a bit of a talk about English traditions um, and English food, because um, oh, to start with, I must say, I think England has quite a bad reputation for food, but England and English food, in my opinion, is some of the best in the world. We are, because we are such a multicultural society, meaning we have, you know, we have people from all over the world who live in England, we have such a variety of food, especially if you went to London, you could have Lebanese food, Indian food, Russian food, Polish food, Anything you can imagine, you can find it in London. Um, and I also think we're quite fortunate that food is fairly cheap here, really, um, compared to other places I've lived. Uh, for example, in Australia, food was really expensive, uh, in my experience. So I think we're lucky in England, we've got good food for quite, you know, good cheap food, but still pretty good quality. Um, so hello again, and let me just, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna get started. Um, like I say, any questions? Um, if you remember, these are my cats. That's Giles, the big one. And that's Wesley, the cat in the box. Cats in a box, they love it. So, if we're going to talk about English traditions, as always, I'm just going to swap my uh, screen around here. Do you know what that is? Obviously it's sausage and mashed potato, but do you know what we call that in England? I'm going to give you a minute to see if there's anyone who can answer this. We have a, a kind of a nickname for it. making me hungry looking at it but we call sausage and mash bangers and mash and I'm going to talk about why in a little bit okay so what is a tradition it's a noun um, and it says the transmission of customs or beliefs from generation to generation or the fact of being passed on in this way so that basically means a tradition, it's passed down from generation to generation. So there are things that my grandma did and my great grandmother did that's been passed down to my family. And in England, obviously, I'm sure you guys know, every family has certain traditions. So for example, in England on Christmas morning, our tradition as kids, um, hello everyone who's joining, hello, talking about traditions. Um, our tradition as kids on Christmas Day was to 
um, always jump in my parents' bed first thing in the morning when we were, when we were little. And, and that became a Christmas tradition. That's how we started every Christmas day. So a tradition can be in the family or it can be something um, more widespread. And England has got some really funny traditions, which I'm going to talk about. And just a side note, another tradition uh, that's quite common in England, just a small one, is we have something called Dress Down Fridays which means if you work in an office in the week, you will need to wear a suit or, you know, look smart um, and you can't wear casual clothes. But on a Friday, most offices, we call it dress down Friday and you can wear jeans or a hoodie or sweatpants and um, whatever clothes you find comfortable, basically. And I don't know where that tradition came from, but um, that still happens now. So if you come to England and you work in an office, chances are on a Friday you'll be dressed down for the week, for the day. Uh, so I thought that was just something to share. Now, obviously, if we're going to talk, talk about traditions, the first thing I'm going to start with is an English cuppa. An English cup of tea. Now, <laughs> I think... My fiance and I, I think we have a minimum of 10 cups of tea a day, at least 10 cups of tea a day, maybe more. And the way we have our tea is, um, is called an English breakfast tea or orange pico might be called some places and tea bag, boiling water, splash of milk. If you're a builder, it's a bit of a joke in England, but if you're a builder or you work in the trade industry, the stereotype is that your tea will have two sugars and a splash of milk, a strong tea. And a good question there, do we drink coffee? Yes, we do drink coffee. Um, coffee's become a lot more popular over the last um, maybe 20 years. Um, there's a lot more coffee shops. In fact, during the recession, when money got really bad and our economy went really bad in 2008, one of the only industries uh, that still had a very high profit uh, was the coffee industry. So that's very interesting. And a good question here, do you always have tea with milk? Most English people, yes. Yeah, I would say everyone I know for sure. Um, most people would have cow's milk. Um, but some people, obviously, if you're vegan or whatever, you can get lactose-free milk, almond milk, rice milk. Um, but generally speaking, everyone has a cup of tea with a bit of milk. Um, so I found out some facts about where, where did this come from? Why is England known for its tea? Um, and apparently it wasn't until the mid 17th century uh, that tea first appeared in England. Um, Obviously, you know, we kind of know that uh, the use of tea spread from Asia, uh, reaching Europe by the way of Venice, so Italy, around the 15, 1500s. Um, and Portuguese trading ships, basically, it was traded in Europe. And um, it was the Portuguese and Dutch traders who first imported tea to Europe. Um, there was also a lot of smuggling, especially during the Middle Ages and later on. Um, there was tea was smuggled. Um, it was cheaper to buy it illegally from a smuggler than it was just in a shop. Um, and it just became more popular from there. Um, another good question. What about tea with lemon? Oh, that is nice. I've had that. I would like that but not a very common thing in England. Um, herbal teas, people, I mean, people do drink herbal tea. Um, I think as England becomes more health conscious, which it has recently, um, herbal teas are on the rise, meaning there are a lot more people drinking herbal tea. But honestly, you go to anyone's house in England, the first thing they'll say, do you want a cup of tea? 
um, and it's actually quite a comforting thing. Um, for example, um, if someone has passed away or died, um, normally the first thing someone will say is, I'll put the kettle on, I'll make a cup of tea. Um, and it's something very comforting. Uh, there's not a ritual, there's not anything strict, um, but tea drinking as an everyday occurrence, but also it's very comforting. It's very, um, it's very soothing, you know, if you're sad, someone will always make you a cup of tea and it's, you know, it's just a nice thing we do for each other. Um, so that's how I wanted to begin this talk because I'm English. I've just had a cup of tea. Otherwise you'd see me drinking another. Um, now this, I'm moving on to an event that we have that you may have heard of. Maybe give me a wave or thumbs up if you've heard of Guy, Thor Guy Fawkes Night, um, also known as Fireworks Night. And this is very, very unique to England. When I went to New Zealand, when I was 21, a long time ago, I was very ignorant and I remember no one celebrating Guy Fawkes Night or Bonfire Night and I, I didn't understand why weren't people celebrating it and then I realised this is a very um, traditional English celebration. Uh, there's a little poem uh, which I will read to you. I know it off the top of my head so I don't know why I need to read it. Um, and it's remember, remember the 5th of November, gunpowder, gunpowder, treason and plot. I see no reason why gunpowder treason should ever be forgot. And, um, and I've got some good questions here, so I'll, I'll answer that in, in just a moment. Um, so this gunpowder and treason, treason is if you're, uh, if you, um, reject the queen in some way or the monarchy how uh, you do something you, you disgrace yourself or disgrace your country you commit an act of treason um so there was this guy called guy fawkes and i'll read you this and tell you a little bit about it so guy fawkes and his co-conspirators planned to carry out the infamous gunpowder plot a scheme to blow up the house of lords Fawkes was caught in the nick of time and the country lit bonfires to celebrate the fact that King James had survived this dastardly assassination attempt. So, basically, let's break down what that's about. So there was a guy called Guy Fawkes and in England, I'm sure you've heard of the Houses of Parliament. This is where MPs meet, the Prime Minister will go, they'll have lively debates. Um, and we have two houses. We have the House of Lords and the House of Commons. Um, and hello, everyone who's joining. Thank you for joining us. Um, so Guy Fawkes had a plot to blow up, explode the um, House of Lords. Um, but he was caught in the nick of time, which means uh, he didn't manage to follow through with his plot. Um, and for some reason, and this was about 1605, I believe. Um, for some reason, um, we celebrate this, this failed assassination, which means another word for murder, assassinate someone, you're going to murder them to assassinate. Um, trying to murder King James and the fact he didn't succeed, we for some reason celebrate it. So every November, the 5th of November, um, we have this big fireworks display. Um, we build effigies, which is just basically like a, we build like a straw man to symbol Guy Fawkes. And we have a big bonfire. We light fireworks and sparklers and we eat hot dogs and we have a big celebration of this failed plot um yeah so that's a really classic english tradition every year 
remember, remember the 5th of November, Gunpowder, Treason and Plot. Um, it's a song that you'll hear kids singing, adults still sing. Um, it's, yeah, interesting one. Or I think so. Um, and I've got a great question here. Can you make English scones? Very good point um, to make. Scones or scones? People, hello, hiya, thanks for joining. Um, there's a lively debate in England whether you say an English scone or an English scone. Both are correct. It doesn't really matter. Um, people think scone sounds posh and scone is a bit more common. So maybe it depends where in the country you're from. Probably up north they would say scone and down south we might say scone. Um, but it really doesn't matter. And yes, that's a very good point. I'm glad you brought up English scones because um, they go very well with a cup of tea. We normally have a scone with clotted cream and jam and it is delicious. It is so good. So recommend that. If you come to England, go to a tea shop. Um, you can have, we call it high tea. Um, and you can have little triangle sandwiches, some scones. In fact, I'm going to show you a picture because high tea is just lovely or afternoon tea. Afternoon tea. Let me show you. That's a great point. So afternoon tea. This is probably a great example. You've got a pot of tea, of course, with milk and sugar. You have little sandwiches, um, scone or scone with a little bit of jam, clotted cream, and then some cakes. And uh, it's a treat, let me tell you. It is lovely to have afternoon tea. Um, okay, the next thing I was going to talk about. Oh, this one I was quite excited to research about. Um, because uh, it's something that I feel like unless you live, unless you've lived in a little village in England, you will have never heard of this or I'm hoping you haven't. But maybe give me a thumbs up if you've heard or if you know what this is. These men. Can anyone see they've got bells on them attached to their legs? Can you see these little jingly bells? They have uh, handkerchiefs and normally they'll have sticks as well and someone playing live music. And this, has anyone guessed it? Does anyone know what it is? I'll give you guys a few few seconds to have a think. Um, I've seen these this many times because I grew up in a, quite a small village south of London. Um, but the, anyway, these are called Morris dancing, Morris dancers. And Morris dancing is a real like oldie English kind of thing. Um, dating back to the early 1400s. Um, it's really a village or um, like local festival, folk festival or fair. Um, let me give you an image. So picture a group of men or women dressed in old fashioned clothes with bells jingling on their legs, holding sticks or handkerchiefs and dancing rhythmically to simple traditional music played on a fiddle or accordion. And you get the idea. So I actually have a video that I wanted to show you um, because Morris dancing, it's hilarious. It still happens. Um, where I'm from, in Crawley, south of London, uh, I used to go to something called Ifield Mayfair, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. And you'd have Morris dancers there. Um, so I'm gonna show you a little video, just so you get an idea, because it's quintessentially English. It is absolutely brilliant. So let me just hit play here, and get an idea.
<laughs> I don't know why, but Maury's dancing just makes just brings me so much joy. I just find it so funny. Um and such a classic uh classically English thing. Um it literally I don't know why, but it just makes me laugh so much. Um so just as you saw from the video, lots of people jumping around, <laughs> banging sticks, jingling their bells. Um, it is really good fun. And I hope you guys listening will come to England and go to a fair. It doesn't happen every day. It's definitely not an everyday occurrence, um, but it is really good fun. Um, and really, you know, they're quite talented. And you like to say you have someone with an accordion, and someone with a fiddle, doodle, doodle, doodle. and uh, it's fantastic. I would really recommend going to a local fair. Um, to give you an idea, actually, of a local fair, um, brings me on to one one of my latest slides, uh, which I will talk about now, is something called May Day. Um, and this is a tradition for at least 500 years, on the 1st of May, people get up very early, but still have partying from the night before. If you live in Oxford, you go to Magdalen College and you hear the, the choir singing. And we have May fairs, which are celebrated ac across the country. And we, this lady, in this case, is the May Queen. Um, what is a May Queen? Let me tell you. Um, when you have a fair, uh, like a local village fair on the 1st of May so only once a year um, normally they choose a young girl from the local village or the local town and she will dress up in very traditional old English clothes and um, there'll be May princesses walking behind her and um, sometimes she might be on a horse and cart um, and I know this very well because I was never May Queen. I was never May Queen, but I had friends who were, who were May Queen and um, I used to get very jealous because I never got to be May Queen. Um, but it's a really, really lovely, lovely uh, traditional village thing. Um, just to give you an idea, so at the May Fair you will get things like Morris dancing, like we just saw, the people dancing around. Um, you'll also get something called the Maypole, this is actually an image of the fair I used to go to when I was young. In fact, this was my school, because this was the school uniform we had. And what you used to do, you would have a certain ribbon and you'd dance around the maypole. And again, it would only happen once a year on May Day, 1st of May. Um, and you'd have things like bouncy castles, Morris dancing, um, this, so Ifield, that's where I'm from, a little village called Ifield, and then Mayfair. The reason it's spelt this is not spelt F-A-I-R. It's the same meaning as a, as a fair, it's just spelt in Old English, I think, just to, because it's, because it's an old celebration. And this used to be something we used to do we used to walk across the pond on this bit of rope. And I tell you, this was terrifying. This was so scary. When I was younger, walking across that little, it, I, did I say lake? Pond. It was a little tiny pond. And you used to be so scared walking across, but it was great fun. Um, so that's, that's another tradition that we have. First of May, every year, everyone has a big party uh, in your local village um please stop me if you have any questions or if there's anything you'd like to ask or you want to add to the conversation i'm happy to answer anything likewise if i'm going too quickly and you want me to slow down please just go ahead um okay another tradition um that i'm sure you know well i i would very much doubt if any of you had heard of this tradition. It's called cheese rolling. That's right, cheese rolling. 
And this is in Cooper's Hill, Gloucestershire. Anyone who saw my talk last week would know that you don't pronounce Shire, it's Gloucestershire. And basically, there's a huge um, roll of cheese. It's thrown down a hill and stupid English people <laughs> like to roll down the hill and the first one to get the cheese is the winner. It is absolutely bonkers, meaning it's ridiculous. Um, we think it could even be pre-Roman era, so it's really, really old, but no one knows where it's come from. Um, it's just very silly and very fun. Um, so if you come to England, go to Gloucestershire, again, one day a year, I don't know when, probably just in the summer, and you can chase some cheese down a hill. Um, that's what I love about um, English traditions, is a lot of them are just silly and fun. You know, nothing, you know, it can be really light-hearted. We do have some really fun, silly things that people do. Um, uh, another tradition that you probably will have heard of is uh, Easter. And um, Easter, uh, we have two weeks off uh, of school. Well, the students do. I work in a school, so I also get two weeks off, which is amazing. Um, so Easter is the tradition every year. Um, it's 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 about it's a Christian you know holiday. Uh, it's about Jesus, um, but really unless you're religious which is fine people then go to church and you know they do lots of religious um traditions there um but they we have something called easter and the easter bunny um and that's where we hide easter eggs or chocolate eggs in the garden normally or if the weather's terrible inside and little kids have to um find the easter eggs so children are led to believe that eggs have been hidden by the easter bunny a tradition that stems from at least the 17th century one theory as to the origin of the easter bunny is that in the spring around easter time hares which are like rabbits but they're hares they're a bit bigger bigger ears behave oddly leaping about in the fields and fighting due to their mating rituals. Um, the symbol of the egg uh, was already a powerful one, representing the idea of rebirth. So the Easter egg is meant to symbolise the tomb of Jesus and a reminder that he rose from the dead. Um, so maybe I should, I should have got a picture here of the Easter bunny. Um, the Easter bunny. And I can show you some Easter eggs as well. Um, so there's not really a classic image for an Easter bunny, but normally it's a bunny rabbit and a little basket and some chocolate eggs. And we give the children eggs. You can see, oh, this is a really cute picture. Aww. So normally for little kids, they run around the garden and they pick up eggs that their parents are, have hidden and uh, they're meant to be from the Easter Bunny. And just to show you, they also do big Easter eggs. So as a kid, you would be so happy because you would get a big chocolate egg like this and you'd get to eat it. So this would be a classic Smarties Easter egg. Look at the size of it, it's huge! Normally wrapped in foil some smarties inside and as a kid unfortunately not anymore not as an adult but as a kid you'd get easter eggs from your aunties your uncles your grandparents your parents friends everyone would give you an easter egg and you'd pile them high and you were never allowed to eat them all in one go as much as you wanted to um, and it's still a tradition that lives on now. So come come to England in May time. You can go to a Mayfair, 
see some Morris dancers and eat lots of chocolate. Best time of year in my opinion, it's a great time. Uh, so that's the Easter bunny. And oh, this, um, another tradition. <laughs> I hope you guys are finding this interesting because I certainly am. Um, <laughs> when I went to Canada, I lived in Canada for three years. And I, you know, it was that time of year when uh, the horse chestnuts were falling from the trees. And in England, we call them conkers. So this is a horse chestnut. Um, they come from like spiky green balls that fall from the tree in autumn. Now, and we call them conkers. That's one conker, conkers. So why am I bringing up conkers? I'm bringing up conkers because all children and adults as well, we play games with these. What we do is we get some string and we thread it through a conker and the idea is to bash your conker against your component to smash their conker. So if I have a conker and Johnny up the road has a conker and we smash them into each other to try and break the other's conker. Um, I'm just going to again get another image up here so you can see what I mean. A conker fight. Um, it was actually eventually banned in schools, sadly, because um, I guess there was a few injuries. I don't know. I think that's a bit silly. But let me show you what I mean. A conker fight. So a conker, a bit of string, and this kid is going to hit his conker into that one to see if he can break it. Um, people would do all sorts of cheats. They would soak their conker in vinegar to make it really hard or boil it in water or put it in the microwave anything to make your conker the strongest conker in school um and so every autumn as the conkers fall or horse chestnuts kids will be playing this game um so i wanted to share that tradition with you because i again when i went traveling no one had ever heard of conkers which uh, I thought was a shame. Okay. So, another, <laughs> another, I, I think the word of this talk needs to be bonkers. And um, by bonkers, I mean crazy, because English people do some really stupid things. <laughs> this tradition. God, it's going to make me cry with laughter again, like the Morris dancing. Um, this tradition is absolutely bizarre. Um, I'm just going to show you a picture to start with. Um, this guy is carrying a barrel with burning tar. So <laughs> there's a town in Devon, which is, um, let me show you on my map. Oh, actually, this might be a bit small, but there's lovely old England. Apologies for the shadow. Devon's right on the coast, right down uh, southwest. So Devon's there. And I used to go camping in Devon as a kid. Loved it. Absolutely loved camping in Devon. Never did I see this. I think my parents probably thought it was too dangerous. Or oh, hazardous, another great word for dangerous. Um, it probably, um, for those listening earlier, when we were talking about um, Guy Fawkes and remember, remember the 5th of November gunpowder, treason and plot. Around this time, we think this tradition started and the people in, in this town in Devon, they roll these barrels down the street. They're on fire and that's it. I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea what the purpose is. Um, I don't know if there's an end, um, but basically they roll a barrel down the street while it's on fire. It's a bit like the cheese rolling that we talked about earlier, except more dangerous. So very bizarre. English people are weird. So many weird traditions. Um, now, 
Uh, good. Um, and please remember, ask me any questions if you have anything that you want to ask me. Um, now I'm going to talk about um, some food because for me it's nearly dinner time and when I was making this presentation I was getting ravenous which is a great word for like super super hungry um so I thought we could talk about some traditional English food um so like I said at the beginning um English food is amazing in my opinion you really can get everything and anything that you want um but a real classic English dish, which I've got to talk about first of all, fish and chips, normally with a wedge of lemon and quite often mushy peas. And if you go to any pub in England, they will serve fish and chips. If they don't, let me know and I'll go there and tell them off because I've never experienced a pub that doesn't sell fish and chips. So, apparently, as early as 1863, it is believed a man called John Lees was selling fish and chips out of a wooden hut in a market in Lancashire. Um, and generally speaking, this is random, just like Dress Down Friday, where if you work in an office, you don't have to wear smart clothes on a Friday, um, we also eat fish and chips on a Friday. So if you went to a school and went to a school canteen, chances are on a Friday they would serve up fish and chips. Or a pub, a local pub might do a, a fish and chips for the evening because it's Friday. Now, I, I had no idea why this was. Again, some of these traditions, you just, you know it, but you don't know the history of it. And apparently, British people have fish and chips on a Friday because Catholics can't eat meat on Fridays, but fish doesn't count as meat because it's cold-blooded. So there we go. Apparently, that's why we eat fish and chips on a Friday, so the Catholics could also eat fish and chips. Um, I don't know if that's 100% true. Um, any Catholics out there, feel free to let me know. Um, but I thought that was really interesting. Um, another classic, oh my goodness, I've got to show you this. I mean, you might find this disgusting, this, Im this image, but to me, this is pretty much heaven. Big breakfast or a big brekker. So a big breakfast normally is only eaten on a Sunday. And to be quite honest, most people have a big breakfast if they've had a bit too much to drink the night before um i mean it's huge you normally have toast bacon mushrooms baked beans eggs sausages and this is something called black pudding which is not super common but people would have it and hash browns um a big breakfast i mean it's a classic you can't come to england and not get a big breakfast you could buy a big breakfast in a cafe for a couple of quid and it would, it would sort you out for the day. Um, when we say breakfast as well, we literally mean break fast. So break in the fast. So obviously you've slept all night, you've not eaten anything, which is so the word fast, you're fasting. Um, and then in the morning you break that fast uh, with breakfast. Um, so prior, so before or prior to the 1600s, breakfast in England usually was bread, cold meat or fish and ale or beer. Because in England, water was so dirty and disgusting, it was actually healthier to have ale or beer. So you can't imagine it now, waking up and having a beer first thing, but needs must. Um, so tea, people would have tea, chocolate, uh, hot chocolate and coffee around the 1600 to 1700s, but eventually tea or coffee became more popular um, as a breakfast drink. And thank you, good question here. What kind of fish do you prefer? 
Oh, my favourite fish. Um, I really like salmon. In fact, last night my boyfriend and I made um, salmon in puff pastry. Oh, it was delicious. Um, yeah, I think that's my favourite. What's your favourite? Um, but I do also like cod and chips, the fish and chips on, with batter that we just saw. Um, another classic English meal um, is the Sunday roast. Um, so a roast dinner, again, only on Sundays. Nobody would have a roast dinner on a Tuesday. It's definitely for Sundays. Um, you normally get a bit of veg, some meat. This looks like it's lamb. So it's normally lamb, but you can have chicken. It doesn't really matter. Not turkey. Turkey is only for Christmas Day. You wouldn't have turkey any other time in the year, generally speaking. Just turkey on a Sunday, uh, on Christmas Day. And this is a Yorkshire pudding. Oh, my mouth is watering. Yorkshire pudding with gravy. This liquid wet stuff is some gravy. And a Yorkshire pudding is like batter, uh, basically. Um, apparently, the Sunday roast uh, became popular during the reign of King Henry VIII in 1485. Um, British people used to eat a lot of meat. Um, and you may know this, actually. If you've seen the changing of the guards outside Buckingham Palace, um, so the men with the big, fluffy, uh, tall hats, we call them beef eaters. Um, and that's because since the 15th, 15th century, uh, their love of eating roast beef. Apparently that's where it came from. So a roast dinner, normally lamb or beef or chicken with a Yorkshire pudding, um, can't go wrong. If you go to a pub again on a Sunday, um, you can get a nice roast dinner and uh, the time that you eat a roast dinner is about three o'clock in the afternoon. So it's normally meant to be sort of a Sunday um, lunch dinner. So normally on Sunday, you'd have your big breakfast in the morning and that would keep you going till about three o'clock when you'd have your roast dinner. Um, yeah, a classic, can't go wrong. Um, now, those of you who are right at the beginning of the talk, so when we're talking about sausage and mash, um, which we call bangers and mash. Um, apparently the term bangers supposedly originated during World War I when meat shortages resulted in sausages being made with a number of fillers, notably water, that caused them to explode when cooked. So there we go. That's why we call them bangers and mash. Another classic English food. And, oh, you know those Yorkshire puddings we saw earlier? That's the same thing. This is batter. And this is called toad in the hole. A really classic English dish. Normally served with gravy and maybe mashed potato. Um, yeah, toad in the hole. Sausage and Yorkshire pudding together. Pork pie. I don't know why, but you have to say pork pie in like a northern accent, like pork pie, because if anyone's northern watching this, they're going to hate me. Um, but pork pies, again, it's like another um, sustaining... Um, really meaty, uh, heavy, stodgy. Um, you can have it as a meal, but most people would have it sort of a snack. Um, in fact, let me put the picture around. So pork pie's got meat, short crust pastry and jelly, um, which is like animal fat. Um, personally, I don't like pork pies. Ooh. Um, my dad, on the other hand, he loves a pork pie. Pork pie, slice of pork pie, or you can get little miniature ones. Um, and it's because the meat is chopped rather than minced, and the crust is formed by hand. Um, I would say, for those of you who saw my uh, Oxford talk, or if you come to Oxford, there's a place called the Covered Market, 
and it's literally a market um, undercover and you can buy these amazing pies and pastries and sausage rolls and they're delicious and warm and quite cheap um, so you can't go wrong and the final food that I wanted to talk about which may surprise you or may not but English curry um, in England we have a really really large um, Indian population um, my hometown Crawley we had a lot of uh, Hindus and Muslims and all sorts from all over the world and it was wonderful because um, not only because you you interact with all sorts of different cultures um, but obviously the food uh, that uh, people from different countries brought over um, what really England came to came to life with that before the 70s food in England you might have heard this expression meat and two veg meaning you'd have your meat you'd have two vegetables maybe broccoli and carrots and that was your dinner maybe some potato it was very um bland you could have things um my dad used to have spam sandwiches and spam is ham in a can so if you, i'll say that again spam is ham in a can and um you know it, it was it was pretty dire meaning it was pretty terrible uh, English food I'm sure there was some good food but not really my mum always says god food back in the 70s 80s was awful um, but now we really do have such a variety um, so although curry is obviously a traditional English dish it is actually so popular in Britain uh, it contributes to more than 5 billion pounds to our economy five billion pounds so it's very very popular um apparently in 2001 britain's foreign secretary robin cook referred to chicken tikka masala which is a type of curry as a true british national dish and i tell you what i couldn't i couldn't agree more here's a sort of picture so normally you get Saucy, quite a saucy curry, a bed of rice, that's what we call rice, you'd call it a bed of rice. And uh, yeah, oh, blooming delicious, look at that. Um, you can go to a pub, quite often they'll do curry and a pint for £5, which is very cheap. So you get curry, you get a naan bread, maybe a samosa, an onion bhaji and and a pint of beer or juice or whatever you want and uh yeah a fiver bargain um so tell me and any um any questions that any of you have um and it does look yummy doesn't it oh my god my mouth is watering it's nearly nearly six o'clock here um so normally in england we eat dinner about six seven o'clock um, and now I'm starting to think I might have to make a curry although I won't be making curry from scratch unfortunately I'm not that skilled in the kitchen it'll be a jar of curry <laughs> um, yeah so that's is there any traditions that you've heard of that you have any questions about um, I mean there are so many when I was doing the research to this uh, presentation there were so many things that I hadn't even thought about um, that we have so many quirky, um, eccentric, bonkers traditions that we've got. Um, and, you know, you take it for granted, don't you? You, you get used to what you, you, what you know. Um, I think my favourite tradition is probably the Morris dancing. I just think it looks so funny. And... Good question. Do you like cooking? I do like cooking. Yeah, I love cooking, but I'm not a particularly great cook. My, well, my stuff never looks good, but it tastes 
it tastes good and that's the main thing my sister on the other hand oh, she is an amazing cook once she made gin and tonic cakes so gin icing tonic sponges like little fairy cakes they were delightful and uh how often do you eat out a week that's a good question uh never really because it's quite expensive um I, I very rarely get to eat out unfortunately um maybe once every couple of months we'll go to the pub and have a pub um dinner i mean you can like i say you can eat out pretty cheap in england uh, there's always voucher deals and pubs no, or normally do deals like curry and a pint for fiver. Um, but unfortunately, I don't eat out that much. Um, you can, I also don't get lots of takeaways, although a lot of people, I'd say in England, it's more, it's more common than it used to be. Um, I'd say probably the average family might get a takeout once a week, which it's quite a lot because getting a takeaway could be quite expensive but also delicious especially you can get a Chinese takeaway Indian takeaway um, anything you want really um, so we, we tend to do most of our cooking at home I don't eat much meat I don't know about you guys do you guys eat much meat um, we we probably have meat maybe once a week or twice a week and we have quite a bit of fish and when and when you were in london all restaurants were crowded and yes london restaurants always busy um depending where you are in london yeah absolutely if i went into oxford right now um i bet the pubs would be very busy and uh, the restaurants would be busy and uh, normally you don't need to book a table unless you're going somewhere you know quite fancy um but generally speaking um you can you can just walk in you don't need to book a table um but i love i do i, I mean i don't go to london too often but i do eat out whenever i go to london because there is such a variety one time i went to london and i had korean pancakes and i'd never had pancakes like it like with meat and vegetables oh i would recommend actually going to camden market um in camden you can you can sample food and there's this huge outdoor area did you go to camden um and you can try all this all this different food and it's incredible it's really really good um and Probably my favourite thing to eat would probably be going to a pub um, and just having fish and chips. It's such a, if you don't have it often, it's a real treat as well. Um, although curry, oh, curry. Um, yeah, so I hope that you've enjoyed this talk um, and that you've learnt some stuff uh, about England and the bizarre things we've got. There was another um, thing that I wanted, another tradition that I was going to talk about, which I will quickly mention at the end. Um, and it's called a World Nettle Eating Championship. And each year in Dorset, um, people eat as many nettles as they can. Um, the reason this is so bonkers is because nettles, let me show you, uh, sting you. So these nettles, they've got little little spikes on them and uh, they sting you and people eat them. I mean, you can have nettle tea and nettle soup, but you, you know, to just eat them by the hand, just pull it off and eat them, you'd get stung. It's uh, bizarre. Anyway, thank you all uh, very, very much. Um, any questions, please uh, let us know. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed learning about uh, some of the funny traditional things that we English people do. Uh, I'm literally going to go put the kettle on and have a cuppa. All right, take it easy, guys, and speak to you soon. If there's anything you want to hear about, please just message and we'll try and do a talk on it. All right, bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Bye.